Hall. I'm Luciana Spraker with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives, and we're on top of City Hall's roof, which is absolutely one of my favorite places in the city. I'm here with Jonathan Stalkup with Architectural Tours of Savannah, and I've invited him to join us and to talk a little bit about some of the special things you can see up here, which is a place not many people get to come. So welcome, Jonathan. I'm really glad you could join us today. Thanks for having me up here. So let's talk about a, a couple of the things you can see architecturally about City Hall that you don't get to see down from the street. The detail from up here is fantastic. You can see um, the seams in the, the dome um, all the way up to the cupola at the top. Um, first hand or close up view of the flag, which you can see from below, but just the scale of the building from up here um, it's much larger, obviously, than it would be down on the ground. Um, getting up close to the clocks, which it tended to be illuminated from the very beginning when they built City Hall. Yeah. Which is a really important because electricity was fairly new at that time, right? New, experimental, exciting new product to put in the building, um, throughout the building, but definitely wanted people to know it as soon as they saw it from a distance. Okay, so you've been to a lot of domes around the world. How does Savannah's City Hall Dome compare? Savannah's Dome is the last in a 2,000 plus year history of domes, or I shouldn't say the last, but the most update 20th century version of it. And it builds on going back to the Greeks trying to do domes with post and beam. Um, they did something called corbeling, where they just used stones stacked horizontally. The Romans built on that, and they put their stones going at a wedge shape as voussoirs. Um, all masonry, by the time it gets handed down to the 20th century, they were using steel and iron and glass. And this dome is a combination, builds on top of masonry base and uses steel arch supports as it goes up, uh, over the arch. So when we were walking up here, we saw some pretty fabulous stained glass, didn't we? We have an inner and an outer dome. You want to talk a little bit about that? Right, so the stained glass on the inside blocks the view of the construction um, for the steel ribs going through the dome, the outer dome. But having the outer dome protects that ornate stained glass, keeps it from storm damage, um, uh, and sort of builds on top of it. It also creates a layer to house all the clockworks that would have been in the building initially, um, and the illumination for that stained glass, which we're seeing from the outside, these slender windows on the outside, um, primarily there to bring the natural daylight into the stained glass so that you could see it from the rotunda below um, 24 hours a day. So um, one thing that's interesting in the original design that didn't make it on the final building is would have been right where we are. What, what should be right where we are right now? We're missing a quadriga, which would be a four horse statue with a charioteer. And in fact, we're not just missing the one that would have occupied this area, but one on each corner. So four statues with four horses and a chariot each. So I know that city council cut those. They said, you know, we can't afford those. Um, what if those four major statuary groups had been installed, how would that have changed City Hall as we know? Do you think it would have changed what people saw? Um, it definitely would have done. It, interestingly, horses were still the primary mode of transportation when this went up and cars were just coming on the scene. I doubt that played a role in City Hall, cutting them from the budget, but they weren't seen as a throwback to ancient times only, but also a, a link to present day with horses and carriages. What else, you know, might we want to look at being this close to the dome? Is there anything else that we, you know, being at this vantage point that's interesting? Um, seeing all the carvings and this is all, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Indiana limestone used for the building. Um, it almost looks like concrete, the smoothness of it from up here, but um, the fact that each of those balusters, those spindles for the railing were carved out individually and they are exactly alike, so it took some artisanship to accomplish that. <laughs> so while we'll pause while the ship uh, passes us by, City Hall has a great vantage point over um, River Street, but when City Hall was built, that was our port. We had all of the docks and wharves behind um, City Hall, and you could stand here or in on our fourth floor and look out at the ships coming in. So we had a view of the Port of Savannah when this building opened. And you could hear it. And you and could hear it. And if it was a warm day, all the windows would be open. So that horn was coming right through the building. Right. So Jonathan, one of the um, best things about City Hall being up here is what you can see from City Hall. 
And before City Hall, you had the City Exchange here. And many um, historic photographs were taken from the City Exchange, which was built between 1799 and 1801. So photographs starting in the mid 1800s, looking you know, down Bull Street, down Bay Street, in Factors Walk. So this is an important sort of vantage point for Savannah and how it has changed over time. So I was hoping you might talk a little bit about what we see from this view. Well, since it's been a great view since the 1790s, early 1800s, um, most of these buildings weren't here when the city exchange went up. So if you had been able to stand up here around 1800 and, and continued to for the next few decades, you would have seen the custom house going up in the 1840s. Um, the further down the block, there are more cotton factor warehouses uh, most of these were built after City Hall, so you wouldn't have seen them until the 20th century. Um, and then if you look down the other direction, where Moon River Brewing Company is today, that was the City Hotel. And that was designed by William Jay as a City Hotel, or at least attributed to him. And there are some old photographs from the top of the City Exchange where the buildings past that Moon River Brewing Company didn't exist yet and you were able to see the city market in Ellis Square, the building that was demolished in the 50s. You could have seen the water tower in Franklin Square, which used to be called Water Tower Square because of that structure. Um, and then once City Hall went up, they were able to watch the taller skyscrapers a decade later. The um, Savannah Bank building, the white structure on Bryan and Bull, and the old Manger Hotel, Manger. I think it's Manger. Okay, Manger Hotel. Um, and the tree canopy has filled in dramatically since City Hall went up. Um, so when this was new, you could have looked all the way down Bull Street, essentially to Forsyth Park, and noticed the five monuments and the squares that go along Bull Street. And we can see the, the first one in Johnson Square, the Nathaniel Green Memorial, but the others are a little bit obscured uh, with the tree canopy today. Since you brought up the skyscrapers, I think uh, you know that is a good time for me to jump in and you know mention that City Hall was designed by Hyman Wickhover, who designed a couple other important buildings that I like to refer to as Savannah skyscrapers that we've lost. So on the um, other side of Johnson Square, where we now have the SunTrust buildings, used to be another little cluster of skyscrapers that were torn down that included two more Wickover buildings. Um, so Wickover was a pretty prolific architect at the turn of the century, or leading into um, the 20th, 20th century. And I know you're uh, very knowledgeable about Wickover, and I believe that you did a lecture about him with um, the Liberty Bank and there was a picture with his office at the very top oh, of yeah, it. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. He he overlooked Broughton Street. So, so cool. Yeah. And interesting that that, built, that picture was so high res that you could zoom into the top floor window and see his name That's up right. there. That's right. Um, since you're mentioning the architect, I, I noticed a photograph in some of your research, if I can find it here, um, done right after, or taken right after City Hall went up. And this photo um, showed how important the new technology was going to be. They had automobiles in this image, and these all came from Bryson's garage. Uh, Bryson's automobile garage was built just a couple years before uh, City Hall was completed. And correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's the same architect, another building behind in Wickover. It was a Wickover building, and it's on Chippewa Square. Chippewa. Um, and he was selling Franklins, apparently, so all of these cars were Franklins that were brought in. Yeah, and this is actually one of my favorite photographs of City Hall because the building's under construction, you can see the dome structure, all of that framework before the copper sheathing has gone up. So it's, it's really nice to see. We don't have a lot of construction photographs of the building. And unpaved streets down below or minimally paved, perhaps. Absolutely. It sounds like this event was held right after city council to inspect the rest of the streets in the <laughs> county. Yeah, I think they were going out to an oyster roast at oh. Thunderbolt or Isle of Hope. It's a business <laughs> so. and pleasure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, anything you want to add um, while we're looking here? I think it's interesting that the Custom House is on a location that, from what I can tell, may have been the first preservation battle in the city. Um, when they were planning for a new Custom House in Savannah, it was the 1840s, and 1845 in the spring, the newspapers talk about where they should site the new Custom House. And the local newspapers are proposing that it would go on Reynolds Square, where the old Filature building had been. So in a trust lot across from where the Pink House is. 
Um, by summertime, they found out where the location was meant to be and they were not happy about it. And in fact, when you look at the bottom corner of the Custom House, they put a plaque down there depicting the cottage where Oglethorpe spent his time when he was in Savannah. And that building had to be removed in order for the Custom House to go up. Um, that preservation sense continued through the centuries in the, in the 1890s, around 1900, when they were proposing City Hall, they were as a group of colonial dames who were against the removal of the city exchange to put the city hall in this location. That's right. There was a preservation battle over the demolishing the city exchange, and they actually called it perhaps the most historic building in the entire state of Georgia, and they didn't want the exchange torn down to build city hall. And um, city council decided to tear down the exchange to build City Hall here because they said that this was the most important spot for city government to continue its business. So that was a, a tug between progress and history and preservation, but that, like, like that, it was another early historic preservation battle. And the original footprint of the city exchange doesn't seem to have allowed enough room for the City Hall, so they had to take up more land and get some concessions to expand the footprint a little further. Yeah, and you know, it was interesting because that wasn't a local decision that had to go all the way up to the General Assembly. The state legislature had to grant that additional land to expand the footprint to make this building bigger. So Jonathan, you mentioned the clock faces earlier. Uh, do you have anything, you know, of interest about clocks and, and, and their importance for publics? Before everybody had a clock on their phone, they would need a major city point to tell the time. And early on in Savannah, it was the city exchange building. So since 1800, there's been a clock in this location. When they proposed the new city hall, uh, they weren't going to just reuse the old clock, but they also didn't want to throw it away. That preservation mind that had come through with the Colonial Dames may have prompted that. And a local iron worker, Rourke, uh, offered to put it in his iron foundry and it used to be at the end of Bay Street and, and the Riverwalk, so you could have seen the old clock from the new location looking down towards the east. Now you can see a huge container ship coming up here, but just uh, all the reminders of Savannah's commerce and history in one view. So Jonathan, you had mentioned um, Factors Walk earlier, so we've got a great view of Factors Walk here and the Cotton Exchange, which has kind of an interesting tie-in to where we talked about City Hall needed to get permission from the state, and Cotton Exchange has a really interesting story about having to get special permissions to be built. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the Cotton Exchange, built in 1886, uh, straddles Drayton Street, and Drayton runs all the way through the city, ends at the river, um, in order to put a cotton exchange or any building where it, it currently is, they had to build on air rights. So Drayton Street still had to be passable underneath the cotton exchange, and still today you can walk through there. Um, and since it bridges Drayton Street, it's also interesting to note that there are bridges across the other major streets. Abercorn has a pedestrian footbridge, Lincoln Street as well, um, that just connects the walkway, the sidewalk, in front of the Gamble Building, in front of the Stoddard Range, both upper and lower. There's a sidewalk that is built above Factors Walk. Um, and it sounds like from the information, they proposed extending it past the Gamble Building to connect, connect where the Hyatt is today. This is also a great view of the park-like area that we call the Strand. So the area between Factors Walk and Bay Street, which literally is a public park, and a lot of people don't realize it has that name, the Strand, which it's, it's really one of Savannah's earliest parks laid out the same time as our earliest squares. So Jonathan, while we were talking about some of the limestone carvings, we also while they cut the quadriga, Wickover proposed two um, allegorical statues for the front of City Hall, which were executed. So tell us about those. So they ended up doing art and commerce as the two statues. Um, the model for them was the same model, but they, they being the artist, Winstead, made the statue for commerce a little bit cruder and less refined, and the statue for art was much more refined and delicate. Um, he's put symbols with art and commerce. Commerce is holding a ship, and at her feet, she's got an anvil and a gear. And art is holding a painter's palette. Um, and at her feet, she has an ionic column capital. Um, directly below that are actual ionic columns in the front of the building. 
all done out of Indiana limestone. I always thought, you know, these were very appropriate symbols when the building opened for Savannah and still very appropriate symbols today Absolutely. for Savannah. Um, and they, they overlook Bay Street and Bull Street and just overlook our city so, so nicely. Um, so. And the copper would have referenced the copper on the dome initially. That's right. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because many people don't know that we haven't always had a gold dome. Right. Um, and when it first went on, it was a goldish tinge, a brownish gold, uh, but meant to patina into a green color. And it would have done that within a few decades, I assume. Um, it depends what they coated it with, which it sounds like they put some kind of wax on it at the, at the early stages. Uh, just like the Statue of Liberty would have been a gleaming color at the beginning and faded into a green over time. Right. So yeah, we had a gold dome until 1980. I mean, I'm sorry, we had a, a copper, copper patina dome. dome until 1987. And so we haven't had a gold dome very long. So, and it kind of misleads people. Some yes. people who are visiting who aren't very familiar with Georgia, they were like, oh, is this the state capital? But no. Yes. Just Savannah. And our state capital is a gold dome as well, so yeah. that would lead to more confusion. So, but C City Hall is a special place, and I think that just signifies it even more. So, well, thank you for coming on the roof with me, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this little special visit to City Hall and special view from City Hall's rooftop. And we hope you will join us for our next Hungry for History. <laughs>